Okay, so in this session, we're going to talk about anthropology. And most people use the word anthropology to refer to the study of human societies and human cultures. And that is not how we are using that word in this session. So when theologians use the word anthropology, they use that word to refer to what the Bible teaches about human beings. So what does the Bible teach about who we are? How are we created? Why are we here? What is our greatest problem? All of those things, all of those questions fall under the category of anthropology or sometimes what we call the doctrine of man. So I'm going to divide this session into three parts. And the first thing I want to talk about is the creation of man. So we find a nice definition of the creation of man in the Westminster Larger Catechism. And question seven asks, how did God create human beings? It's a good question. Here's the answer that is given. It says, after he had made all the other creatures, God created humans, male and female. He formed the body of man from the dust of the ground and the woman from the rib of the man. He endowed them with living, reasoning, and immortal souls, made in his own image with knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. God wrote his law on their hearts and gave them the ability to obey it, along with dominion over the other creatures. They also had the potential to fall. That's a good description of the creation of man. What do we believe about how we were created? That's a nice summary. Now, I want to pick out some truths that come out of that. And I'm going to mention six, what I think are six key truths about the creation of man. And the first one is that human beings were created by God. Now, that seems utterly simple, um, but that is actually a very profound truth. According to Scripture, human beings are not cosmic accidents, as many people believe today, that we just sort of evolved out of nothing and we're a cosmic accident in the universe. But we are creatures who were created by the eternal God himself. And that has massive implications for how we understand ourselves. Uh, first of all, if we are created by God, that means we are designed. There was a designer. Psalm 119 says, your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. In other words, the fact that we've been fashioned by God causes us to want to seek how we've been fashioned so that we can obey God according to our design. So uh, from a Christian perspective, we're not created to live according to our own design, but the creator's design and when we depart from that design, we bring harm upon ourselves and others. The fact that we are created by God also means that we're accountable to him. If he's the one who created us, he owns us essentially, and we're answerable to him for how we live. So that's a huge key truth about the creation of man. Here's the second thing. Human beings are created with a body and a soul. Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, formed the man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. When God breathed into the first man, he was creating not just a body, but a soul. And this is made clear in other scriptures throughout the Bible. For instance, you remember the passage where Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, Jesus clearly made this, this distinction that human beings have two parts. We have a body and we have a soul, and those cannot be separated during our lives. Third, we could say that human beings are created in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, that's very, very significant that we were created in the image of God. The big question people often ask is, well, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? And there's been all sorts of different suggestions that people have made over the centuries. One suggestion is that the image of God refers to our rationality. So human beings um, can, can, rash, uh, can reason at a much higher level than all of the other creatures that exist. And perhaps it's our rationality, our ability to think at a higher level that sets us apart, and that's what it means to be made in God's image. Some people suggest that the image of God refers not to our rationality, but to our relationality. 
So we can have relationships in ways that other creatures can't. We can have relationship with God in a way that other creatures cannot. And perhaps that's what it means to be made in the image of God. A third suggestion people have made is that the image of God refers to the fact that we have dominion. So human beings are set apart in that uh, God gives human beings, after he creates them, dominion over all the other creatures. And maybe that's part of what it means to be created in God's image. Personally, I think it would be a mistake to try to define the image of God in terms of one characteristic. I think all of these are part of what it means to be made in the image of God. And that being made in the image of God refers to our total being, that we were created to reflect God's image to creation and represent God to the rest of creation. And so one of the major implications of that is that there is a fundamental distinction between human beings and all other creatures. Human life is sacred in a way that animal life is not. And the reason for that is because human beings are made in God's image and no other creature is made in God's image. So that is a fundamental part of the creation of human beings. Here's another fourth thing. Human beings were created not only in the image of God, but created as male and female. So this is not a very profound truth that I'm about to share, but it's obvious that human beings are not disembodied spirits floating around. We are embodied people. We have, we have bodies. We're born with bodies. We're not just spirits. And the fact that we have bodies also means that those bodies from creation are either male or they're female. There's two uh, uh, the two types of human beings that God has created. Um, and so one of the implications of that is that our God-given gender was uh, created by God and is good and is ordained by God. That really cuts against the grain of a lot of mainstream cultural thinking about gender today. A lot of people in, in the wider culture today, when they think about gender, believe that gender is not... God ordained or God uh, defined, but that it's self defined and self chosen. So I choose whatever gender I want to be, and I design myself. That's totally the opposite of what Scripture teaches. Um, many people would say, well, your biological traits don't matter. You can change your body, become whatever you want. The problem with that is, from a biblical perspective, we're created as male and female, and Scripture says our bodies are good. And they're a gift from God. And so to seek to change who I am in that sense is to take what God has called good and say it's not good. And I'm going to change what God has called good. Um, it's sort of putting ourselves in the role of the creator rather than the creature. Here's a quote from a pastor named Von Roberts. He says, our bodies are an essential part of our true selves so what I feel about myself can never be the whole picture because God made us embodied souls. Our bodies are essential in determining and revealing who we truly are. So God created us male and female. Here's a fifth thing about creation. We we're created with a free will. Question 17 from the Westminster Larger Catechism says that, God wrote his law on their hearts, that's human beings, and gave them the ability to obey it. Along with dominion over the other creatures, they also had the potential to fall. So Adam and Eve were created with dominion, they were created with free will, and they were created with the potential to fall. They could choose whether or not to obey God's will before the fall. This shows that human beings are moral agents. And then sixth, another thing we could say is human beings were created with a purpose. If you want to understand your purpose in life, you don't start by uh, looking at yourself. You start by looking at the creator. Your purpose in life is about God. And um, many people always remember the first question to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Well, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We're created to worship God. That's our purpose and glorify him. And uh, one of the implications of that is that worship is hardwired into our DNA. We are created as worshipers. And if we stop worshiping God, we don't stop worshiping. We just worship something else because we are hardwired to be worshipers.
So until we recognize that our lives are about God and not ourselves, we will fail to see our true purpose. So these are some core fundamental truths about the creation of man. Not the only truths, but six big ones. Now, let's go to a second section of this and talk about another important part of the doctrine of man, which is the fall. Uh, I want to read you this quote by C.S. Lewis, which I think is helpful. It says, Christianity asserts that God is good, that he made all things good and for the sake of their goodness, that one of the good things he made, namely the free will of rational creatures by its very nature, included the possibility of evil and that creatures availing themselves of this possibility have become evil. That is a summary of what we mean when we talk about the fall. Here's another summary that comes from the Westminster Confession. And it says, Left to the freedom of their own wills, our first parents were tempted by Satan, disobeyed God's command by eating the forbidden fruit, and so fell from their original innocence. This is the fall. What were the results of the fall? Well, let's go through a few things there as well. We could say, I'm going to mention five things. First of all, one of the results of the fall is that we're separated from God. Isaiah 59.2 says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Prior to the fall, Adam and Eve were in fellowship with God, but a holy God cannot be in relationship with sinful people, and therefore after the fall, human beings are separated from God because of sin. Here's the second thing. We're separated from one another. The fall doesn't just introduce brokenness into our relationship with God, but brokenness in human relationships. So that prior to the fall, there was relational harmony. After the fall, we see discord and division in human relationships, marital discord, anger and violence in the family and in the community and in relationships. This is all the result of the fall. Here's another thing. There's a curse now on creation after the fall. God says to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. And what that indicates is that creation itself is broken after the fall and does not work properly as God intended it and designed it. So this is why today we see disease in the world and we see natural disasters and all kinds of things that happen that clearly were not God's original design, but creation itself is under a curse. Here's a fourth thing. That's a result of the fall. We're enslaved to sin. Uh, Reformed theologians often talk about being enslaved to sin by using the term total depravity. And total depravity refers to a couple of things. First of all, it refers to the extensiveness of our sin. So it's total in the sense that there's not a single part of us that hasn't been corrupted by sin. It's all corrupted totally top to bottom. So here's how the Westminster Confession describes it. It says, By this sin, Adam and Eve fell from their original righteousness and fellowship with God, and so became dead in sin and completely polluted in all their faculties and parts of body and soul. So it's total in that it's complete corruption. Every part of us has been tainted. But it also, total depravity also refers to the fact that sin renders us completely unable to save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves because sin has enslaved us. So another quote from the Westminster Confession says, This original con corruption completely disinclines, incapacitates, and turns us away from every good while it completely inclines us to every evil. What this means is that apart from God, we cannot save ourselves. We will not, uh, we, we cannot come to God on our own um, because our hearts are so corrupted by sin and bent towards evil. Paul talks about this in Romans 8. He says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So it's not just that the mind that's weighed down by sin uh, doesn't submit to God's law. It can't submit to God's law. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. From a biblical perspective, sin enslaves us apart from Christ. And our only hope is if God somehow intervenes and sets us free from that condition. And then here's a fifth thing. If that weren't depressing enough, <laughs> we're, in, uh, we're subject to physical and spiritual death as a result of the fall. So God told Adam and Eve, 
He said, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That death that is referred to there is not just physical death. It is physical death. They, they, uh, death was introduced into creation after the fall physically. However, it's also spiritual death or being separated from God from an eternity, for an, all eternity. And that was symbolized when Adam and Eve were banished from the garden and a flaming sword was placed between them and the tree of life, uh, symbolizing the fact that they were now subject to physical and spiritual death. So that's all bad news. But here's good news as well, and this is the third part of the, our focus on the, the doctrine of man or anthropology, is that God did not leave us in our sin, but he intervened. And that brings us to this final section, which is on what we call the covenants of Scripture. So the covenants throughout the Bible, the primary way that God relates to his people is through covenants. And we read this in the Westminster Confession. It says, the distance between God and his creation is so great that although reasoning creatures owe him obedience as their creator, they nonetheless could never realize any blessedness or reward from him without his willingly condescending to them. And so it pleased God to provide for man by means of covenants. Now, there are many different covenants in the Bible. But Reformed theologians have argued that you could take all of those various covenants and kind of group them together under two major overarching covenants. So the first one is what we call the covenant of works. And this is not, uh, the, the, you will not find the word covenant of works in the Bible. This is a term that is, is created to try to describe a reality we see in the Bible, which is that God made a covenant with humanity prior to the fall. Um, and the covenant was fairly simple. God says, you may eat of any tree in the garden that you want, except for one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. That's the one command. And there was, there, that was the covenant between God and man at that time. Theologians describe this as a probationary period. <laughs> Adam and Eve were on probation. In other words, they were not yet fallen at that point, but they also weren't yet confirmed in a state of righteousness or eternal life. They had a choice as to which way they were going to go. If they had obeyed God, presumably they could have eaten from the tree of life and lived in a state of righteousness with God forever. However, we know that if they disobeyed God and ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then they would be subject to physical and spiritual death. This was the covenant of works. That's what we, are, what we mean when we talk about the covenant of works. God's command to obey and the uh, Westminster Confession describes it this way. It says, The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works. In it was promised to Adam and through him all his descendants on the uh, light. Oh, excuse me. In it, life was promised to Adam and through him to his descendants on the condition of perfect personal obedience. Now we know that Adam and Eve did not obey that command, right? And instead, they disobeyed God's command. Consequently, they were separated from God, subject to uh, moral and spiritual death, and all of Adam and Eve's descendants were also corrupted by sin. That's what we mean when we talk about the doctrine of original sin. Original sin refers to the fact that humanity, from this point forward, inherits a sinful nature so that every single human being is born, not as a neutral blank slate, but born with a sinful nature already from day one. Another quote from the Westminster Confession says, Since Adam and Eve are the root of all mankind, the guilt for this sin has been imputed to all human beings who are their natural descendants and have inherited the same death in sin and the same corrupt nature. So we're born with this sinful nature inherited from Adam and Eve because of the broken covenant of works. Now, thankfully, God does not leave us in that condition. But what God did was he enacted a second great overarching covenant, which is what we call the covenant of grace. And again, the words covenant of grace are not found in the Bible. This is a term that's used to describe something we see in the Bible, a reality we see in the Bible, which is that God had a gracious plan and a promise to redeem humanity from sin. To quote again from the Westminster Confession, 
by his fall, man made himself incapable of life under that covenant of works. And so the Lord made a second, the covenant of grace, and in it, he freely offers sinners life and salvation through Jesus Christ. In order to be saved, he requires faith in Jesus and promises to give his Holy Spirit to all who are ordained to life so that they may be willing and able to believe. That's the covenant of grace. And what Reformed theologians have argued is that if you read the Bible after the fall of Adam and Eve, the entire story of scripture from that point forward is God's unfolding covenant of grace. It's not as if when we get to Jesus, this is a new idea. It's been God's plan all along since the fall. The whole story of the Bible is just one story of God's unfolding covenant of grace. So that the covenant of grace was announced in the garden in Genesis 3.15, when God said one of Eve's descendants, her seed would what? Crush the head of the serpent. This was, this was announcing God's covenant of grace, announcing his plan to at one day defeat Satan through one of Eve's descendants, namely Jesus Christ, and that was announcing the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace was established when God promised to Abraham that he would bless him and make him a great nation. And then he said to Abraham, I'll bless all the families of the earth through you. Well, how would that be accomplished? One of Abraham's descendants would bring salvation to all the families of the earth. And the New Testament says that promise to Abraham to bless all the families of the earth was fulfilled when Jesus Christ died on the cross. The covenant of grace was reaffirmed when God brought his people out of Egypt and he gave the law to Moses. And, and according to the, the New Testament, the Mosaic law, the purpose of the Mosaic law was to show the people their need for a savior. It was to prepare the way for Christ, to show them we can't keep this law and we need a savior to come and help us. And all many of the parts of the law, like the sacrificial system, were meant to be shadows of things to come, pointing forward to Christ, the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate priest that the people needed. And so this was reaffirming God's plan of salvation, his covenant of grace. Then it was clarified, the covenant of grace was clarified through David. It was clarified when God made a promise to David and he said, one of your sons is going to sit on the throne and have an eternal kingdom. And some people thought, well, maybe he was referring to Solomon. But we know Solomon came and he went and he died. And the Jews began to understand that that promise was bigger than Solomon. It was referring to the Messiah. And that this covenant of grace pointed forward to a king of kings who would come and bring all of God's promises to pass. And so finally, the covenant of grace was fulfilled through Christ when he comes and he dies on the cross for the sins of the world. And so Christ's death is the fulfillment of all the promises that came before. You see how all of it's connected? Jesus fulfills all of the promises. So he fulfills the promise in the garden to crush the head of the serpent. He fulfills the promise to Abraham to bring salvation to all the families of the earth. He fulfills the Mosaic covenant by being a once and for all sacrifice. He fulfills the promise to David by being the Messiah and the King of Kings for whom the people had been waited. Jesus is the fulfillment of all these promises so that when Jesus says at the Last Supper that he's instituting a new covenant, and he, 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 he says that to his disciples, in a sense, it's not really new. It is a new covenant. He's ushering in a new uh, period of time, but in a sense, it's really just the fulfillment of all the promises that came before in God's covenant of grace. And what's important to recognize is that Christ's death on the cross fulfills both the covenant of grace and the covenant of works. Here's what I mean by that. He fulfills the covenant of grace, obviously, by bringing salvation, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life to lost sinners. That's obvious. But notice that at the same time, Jesus fulfilled the covenant of works because he succeeded in doing what Adam and Eve failed to do. Where Adam and Eve failed to be perfectly obedient to God's law, and consequently, they fell, Jesus was the new Adam who was perfectly obedient to God's law and perfectly kept through his works everything that God commanded. And because Jesus was perfectly obedient to God's law, his righteousness could then be given to us. And it's important to recognize that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die to take away our sin. He, that was part of it. But he also died on the cross to fulfill the 
the covenant of works to live a perfectly obedient life. And because Jesus did this, we can be made righteous through him. Um, because when a person trusts in Jesus Christ, not only is our sin forgiven, but his perfect record of obedience is counted to us. So therefore, when God looks at us, he says, you fulfilled the original covenant of works. Not because of your own record, but because of Christ's record, which has been given to you. All your sin has been taken away and all of his righteousness has been given to you through faith in him, which is why we can be perfectly accepted as righteous before God. It's because Christ fulfills both the covenant of grace and the original covenant of works that Adam and Eve failed to fulfill. So in the next session, we'll talk more about salvation specifically and how Christ's death on the cross saves us. And we'll get more and more into those questions as well.